you are still tuned to Wanapedia, your one-stop center for the history of this country and the rest of the world. The name is Tony Geoffrey Owana, and in charge of operations is Herbert Semya. We are still at the visit of Mwalim Julius Nyerere in 1988, July. And this time round is when he addressed a press conference shortly before he left uh, at Entebbe Airport. Uh, one of the highlights of this one is Tanzania and Nyerere's role in the politics of Uganda, going back to the time of the formation of the East African community, through the war against Amin, and through the troubles of the several governments we had after Amin, and to the time when President Museveni eventually took power. Nyerere explains his role and struggles to absolve himself of many of the accusations which many of us were holding against him in person and Tanzania in general. As he leaves, take a look at some of the leaders this country has had, many of whom are dead and quite a number of whom are now in political oblivion. That is more than 30 years ago, cut safe of Oanapidia. Sunday, 17th of July, 1988, was the fourth and final day of his visit to Uganda. Mwalim Julius Nyerere chairman of Chama Chama Pinduzi CCM, which is the Tanzania's ruling party. He arrived here in the country on the 14th of July, 1988, on the invitation of the National Resistance Movement. But before we bring you the press conference, which was before his departure, let me try to give you a little of his biography. Mwari Munyerere was born in 1922 at Butiama village very close to Musoma on the shores of Lake Victoria. He attended his primary education in Musoma after which he joined Tabora Secondary School before joining by then Makerere University College where he read for a diploma in education from 1943 up to 1945. Dr. Julius Nyerere is also an outstanding scholar, philosopher, international leader who has several distinguished awards as well as more than 15 honorary doctoral degrees. Mwalimu Nyerere led the nationalist movement in Tanganyika from 1952 to 1961 and became the first chief minister and the prime minister of Tanganyika from 1961 up to 1962. Later, he became the first president of Tanz Tanzania in 1963, up to 1985 when he retired. To achieve all this, Mwari Munyere organized and built Tanganyika African National Union and Tanzania African Union TANU and Chama Chama Pinduzi CCM of which he is the chairman. Mwari Munyere is now the chairman of the South Commission. And here now, President Yoweri and Museveni and Dr. Julius Nyerere arriving at Entebbe International Airport. They were received by the Vice Chairman of NRM, Haj Moses Chigongo. At the VIP launch where the press conference took place, Mwalimu Nyerere answered questions from both foreign and local press. And here is the Deputy Minister of Information, Honorable Maombe Mukwana, to open up the press conference. Your Excellency, President Yoweri Kaguta Museveni, 
and chairman of NRM, Your Excellency Mwenikiti of Chama Chama Pinduzi, Dr. Nyerere, the Prime Ministers, the Vice Chairman, Ministers, the Commander of the Armed Forces, Ambassadors, resource persons, ladies and gentlemen, due to time, pressure of time, here we have both local press and international press. You have to introduce yourself and then put your questions. You are welcome. I'm Nalongo Victoria from Ngabo. Mwari Munyerere, the struggle for the liberation of Namibia is almost at its peak now. And both the frontline states and the PTA member countries are teaming up together to impose economic sanctions on South Africa as a means of speeding up the attainment of freedom for our brothers and sisters in Namibia. Now, as a, a founder member of the frontline states organization, but now a retired president. Are you still playing an active role in the liberation struggle? Secondly, how do you view the PTA's economic sanctions on Namibia? Third, do you think these uh, no, that's all right. Sorry? That's all right. Do you think these uh, economic sanctions on South Africa are enough to tame the arrogant minority in South Africa? Thank you very much. Yes, I, as, a, as a citizen of Africa, I still take uh, not only an interest in the liberation of uh, Southern Africa, including now the liberation of uh, Namibia and uh, South Africa itself, uh, but uh, I do whatever, whatever I can as a, as a private citizen. Uh, in um, mobilizing uh, world public opinion in particular that uh, it should help in uh, the struggle to liberate the remaining part of southern africa the remaining part of africa so that's fine the answer is yes i'm still taking part the pta bracing itself to apply sanctions now there perhaps i should uh, i should uh, uh, confess my ignorance is pta bracing itself to impose sanctions against south africa well they passed some resolution they passed some resolution <clears throat> let me say the question of sanctions uh, we have been um, pressing for sanctions against South Africa now for a long time. And it has been our view that the African countries, the independent African countries, bordering on South Africa, are the least placed in trying to apply sanctions against South Africa. They can, if they wanted to. But they are less able to apply sanctions than the other parts of Africa, including the other African parts who are not truly frontline states. And that includes Tanzania. Tanzania is a frontline state in the fight. But we are not a frontline state in the sense that we are bordering on South Africa. So whereas it is very difficult for Mozambique and Angola and Zimbabwe and Botswana and Swaziland and those countries which are truly frontline in the sense of bordering on South Africa, whereas it is very difficult for those countries to apply any kind of sanctions against South Africa, it is not difficult for Tanzania to do the same. We, we can. We can apply sanctions against South Africa. And we did. Uh, immediately after independence, we broke uh, any kind of trade links with South Africa. We, we used to have a, a huge timber, timber industry, timber export uh, in the world. 
uh, it was very big, one of the biggest in uh, East, Eastern Africa was uh, in, in Tanzania. And our biggest market was South Africa. We broke it. We stopped it immediately after independence, and that was the end. We, don't, we no longer export any wood because we didn't have another, another, another importer of our, of our wood. We failed in one, and I must make that confession. We failed in one. We had the diamond mine. And uh, the, the partner we had there was the South African, De Beer, the De Beer company, the, 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 that um, famous company. And we couldn't eat the diamond. And we tried very hard to see if we could go into, into partnership with someone else. We, we failed. That's true. The only, the only area where we failed was diamond. So we still, we still sell diamonds to De Beers. And De Beers is a world organization, but we know it is South African dominated. So we say countries like Tanzania uh, can and should apply sanctions. And they must not say, they must not say, until the frontline states have applied sanctions, we are not going to apply sanctions. This is hypocrisy, and it is, it is, uh, it's unacceptable. So we, we go on pressing for sanctions. So I, I don't know. I don't know what, uh, what sanctions uh, the... PTA countries other than the PTA countries, the PTA countries other than the truly frontline states. I know that they could, uh, they could apply a number of sanctions, and they must not say that pressure is dependent upon what Angola or, or Zimbabwe or Botswana can do, because for those countries it's much more difficult than it is for us, for you, for, for, for Kenya, and for the, for the rest of Africa. And also, the international community. We have been pressing for sanctions from the international, the international community, and of course, the, you know the, the excuses they, they, they make for not applying sanctions. So we will have to go on applying sanctions. That was the, third, the second question. What was the third? African one. The African e economic sanctions are not enough. I think I've, in that case I have answered that. They are not enough, but we must not withhold them because they are not enough. They must be applied to the full. We must apply those sanctions to the full. All African countries which can apply sanctions, should apply sanctions. In themselves, they will not bring down the government of South Africa. But we must nevertheless apply them and, and work for, for comprehensive sanctions by the rest of the international community. Uh, Mr. Chairman, my name is uh, Francis Asimo from Radio Uganda. I would like to ask you in your capacity as the chairman of South Commission. Uh, no doubt you have a lot of experience on regional organizations which have been established to promote regional cooperation, such as uh, SADAC, PTA, ECOWAS, and others. Uh, now, when you look at the South Commission, uh, what kind of institutions, first of all, is it going to use, and how is the future of uh, this commission as far as enticing the South from the North is concerned. First of all, I'm, I'm not quite sure, but I have some experience. I do have some experience about uh, Southern cooperation, some, some, some positive, some negative, and the most negative was East Africa. Uh, I was one of uh, the founders of the East African community and one of those responsible for breaking it up. So that is some kind of experience, if you like. Uh, the way it should never be done. Um, and since I became uh, chairman of the South Commission, I'm learning one of, uh, of the functions, of my function, uh, my functions and also my colleagues, is to, is to study uh, the various uh, manifestations of uh, Southern cooperation, South-South cooperation uh, in uh, Africa, Asia, Latin America. And there are many of those examples in Africa. You have mentioned some, and there are many in Asia, and there are many in uh, Latin America. And our, our duty is to, to find out, to, to understand how they're functioning, and uh, to learn from the, the strong elements so that we can say, look, uh, see how ASEAN in Asia is working. And, these are the strong points of ASEAN, and if others can learn, can also learn from ASEAN, they can learn from ASEAN. We can, we can uh, also uh, point out to what uh, 
a grouping in Latin America is doing or what a grouping in Africa is doing and see what we can learn positively from those. We can only find out why some have succeeded, why some haven't succeeded. And also we can try to put that experience uh, to, to, to this out. We have no intention of, uh, we, we are not planning to, to be proposing large numbers of institutions. Institutions are there. Uh, what we propose to do is simply to, to suggest how those institutions can be made more effective. Uh, one of the weaknesses of, uh, of South-South cooperation is uh, the machinery of implementation. They, they have no machinery of implementation. And if I take a, a, a small example, uh, you sit down, Tanzania and, uh, and um, Uganda could sit down at the top. The presidents, our presidents could sit down and agree on something. They say, let us establish a joint venture in something. And so you, you make that decision. The political decision can be made. Usually we say, uh, you know, that we lack political will. Very often it's not a question of political will because many of the decisions actually are taken by the political leadership. And then what happens after that? There's no machinery. There is no established machinery within Tanzania or within Uganda which takes over this decision and begin translating it into actual action. Uh, I, I attended the, the African summit. Not attended, but I was there in Lagos, the African Economic Summit in Lagos. And we made, we made, uh, we took very good decisions there uh, of how to, to get Africa try to move, cooperate more economically. Uh, I don't remember, and I was not, uh, I was not uninterested. I don't remember that after coming from Lagos, I went to Tanzania, and then I called the cabinet, <laughs> and then called everybody else and say, now, look, we have taken these decisions. Here is a document which commits every African state to, to this. Now, slot this into our planning. We didn't do this. We didn't do it at all. The other day, I was, I, I was speaking to two ministers, a Tanzania minister and a Kenya minister in Dar es Salaam, explaining to them the work of the commission. And I was explaining something called the GSTP, the Generalized uh, System for Trade Preferences, of the, the uh, worked out by the United, by the UNCTAD, and uh, it's a kind, a kind of gut for, for the third world countries. So I asked our minister, the, the, minister in the trade minister in Tanzania who is responsible for this, I said, have you ever taken this to cabinet? He said, no. So the cabinet of Tanzania knows nothing about uh, something called GSTP at all. And the minister knows something about it. So some corner of Tanzania knows that there is this agreement. But the government, the government machinery doesn't know anything at all. We, we don't have a system. So one of the problems of these countries is that they, they don't have a system which can absorb decisions and work upon them. And we, we, will, we will be pointing, I, I think we will be pointing out to that weakness, not necessarily that we are going to form, to form uh, any, any institutions, but to point out to the third world countries a weakness which is there. Decision, the political machinery sometimes does make the decisions, but nothing at the organizational level uh, takes over these decisions and translates them. Uh, it is true, at the global level, we may have to recommend uh, a, an, an, inst an institutional form. For instance, the OECD countries, the, this is the developed countries uh, of the North, uh, the Northwest, are organized, very organized. There are 22 of them. They have a huge secretariat in, uh, in Paris. Uh, I mentioned the other day at the dinner, they have na I'm, I was told they have 900 professionals, not employees. They must have thousands of employees. But they have nine, 900 professionals, seven, 700 of whom are, are, are PhDs. That's 22 countries, very powerful. Each one of them, a single one of them is very powerful. But nevertheless, that is not enough. They're organized collectively. The, the, the third world, do they have a secretary? None. They don't employ one person. And now we, the commission, are trying to behave as a, as a, as a secretariat for the South Commission, but uh, for, for the South, but we are not really that kind of secretariat. So we may recommend, we, we may recommend that in order to, to help, help activate more coordination among the Southern countries, they may need even a small secretariat. We may, so we may uh, recommend some institution, but it is not our intention to recommend uh, lots of institutions. Catherine Bond from the BBC. Mr. Chairman, 
Uh, sometime since you've been to Uganda, is there anything that you've seen or heard that surprised you? And two, do you have any regrets with hindsight about backing Milton Obote in 1980? No, I have no, no regret at all. Why should I have any regret? Uh, I didn't uh, back Obote in the sense that I, I, I made him president. I didn't. Our, our troops helped, uh, uh, helped Uganda to get rid of Amin. And after that, uh, the Ugandans on their own uh, had uh, a succession of administrations. <laughs> uh, but they, they started with Lule. Actually, it's, it's even possible I had more to do with Lule than I had to do with, uh, with Obote. Uh, I, could, I could claim <laughs> that perhaps without Tanzania, Lule might not have been in the position in which he was. Even that one, I doubt very much. But they had Lule, the Ugandans picked up Lule as their first uh, president after, after, after Amin. Uh, he didn't last long. Uh, he thought I was responsible. I wasn't. Uh, then they got uh, they got to be nicer. Did I help you to get be nicer? No, it was, <laughs> it was your own business. <laughs> you got, they got to be nicer. They collected him. I think he was I don't he was in Nairobi somewhere. They collected him from Nairobi. Fine. He came. In, we backed him. We backed him up. And he came in there. We backed him up. And. Uh, at, at last, you got rid of him. Did we help you to get rid of him? <laughs> and he went, and uh, then they had, uh, they had, I think they had an interim period when you shared power uh, and a military commission. Uh, you, were, you were among the military commissioners or something. Uh, a period, and then they had Milton. Uh, we backed him up. Uh, until he disappeared, and we had... Uh, <laughs> and then we had... Uh, Okello, <laughs> we supported him. We supported Okello. We, in that sense, you may say perhaps we were not principled. I think we were very principled because we thought it was really up to you people, up to the people of Uganda, to have their own government. It was not up to us. And quite frankly, had Amin not attacked my country, we'd never have, have, have helped to remove him. We, we, we survived with Amin for eight years, and had he not been foolish enough to attack my country, I don't know whether he would still have been there. These people were working <laughs> against him. But certainly I would never have uh, moved the Tanzania army into Uganda to remove Amin if he hadn't uh, made the stupid mistake of attacking my country. So I can't claim that uh, there is anything we did in Uganda which, uh, we, which we can say we, we regret. We supported uh, a number of... Uh, we have supported uh, all the administrations of Uganda with the exception of that of Amin, actually. That one we never succeeded. We never supported. We made it quite clear from the very beginning we were never going to support it. All the others we have supported. And we, they, I don't know whether, whether they did, uh, I think some of them behaved very, I shouldn't be saying things like that. Uh, another question? Uh, <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I'm David McGuire and I report for the New Vision. Now, Dr. Nyerere, this morning we were talking about a new international economic order. It so happens that the South is heavily indebted to the North, which actually cripples their negotiating power. What solutions do you have for this heavy indebtedness? Thank you. I have no solutions. We have, uh, we, we have made the South, uh, one of the first recommendations we have made concerns debt, among the first recommendations that we've made concerns debt. Do we have a document here? We have no debt, we, have, we don't have a document. But we have made recommendations. Uh, we, the Commission have made a study. We have looked at the problem of debt. Um, and if by, I, may, I may say so, uh, the, the debt problem now is really a major problem for the development of the southern countries. Uh, the figures we have are that the five years up to 1982, five years up to 1982, there was a net flow of resources from the north to the south of about $140 billion. No, north to the south. 
north to the south, north to the south, from the rich to the poor, a net transfer of resources. When there was this, when the heavy borrowing was still going on, no, this, this was actually, this was the borrowing part of it. They were servicing, yes, but they were servicing debt and the, the borrowing, the, the loans were still flowing. And then after 82, stop. When we began, when some of these countries began to run into servicing problem and the North began stopping, giving more further loans to the South. So the flow from the north stopped or slowed down, very much slowed down. But the servicing was at its peak, at its peak. High debts and the servicing was going on. And already those countries were beginning to run into trouble through servicing. So the five years, the following five years, between 80, 80, 80, 80 82, 70, 82, 82, 80, 87. Another net flow of between 85 and 90 billion dollars flowing from the south to the north. Now, 80, 90 billion dollars to, to flow from the south to the north. That means, you know, how do you develop? What do you do? Take a country like Brazil. Brazil has a basically a very strong economy. They, had, they have trade surpluses. No, Tanzania has no trade, trade surpluses. I don't know. What, you may have trade surpluses. We don't have. You are talking about your imbalances. You can't talk about those imbalances if you have a trade, trade surplus. So we have no trade surplus. We, we, spend, we spend more. I don't know. That, that's the miracle. We spend more in import. We import. Our import expenditures is, more is a higher than our export earnings. Not for Brazil, not Brazil. Brazil's, Brazil has trade surpluses of anything between 11, 12, 13 billion dollars surpluses. But they have a huge debt. Now it is 120 billion dollars. So their servicing often eats the whole of it, eats up the whole of it. The whole of that disappears into, into, into servicing debt. And when they have a bad year, last year when I was there, it was a bad year for them. They would be earning some between eight, eight and eight point eight billion dollars. Now that's a lot of money. Now that money should go in because they have saved that money. That is their surplus in trading, trade surplus. That money should help in the development of Brazil. It doesn't help in the, Bra the development of Brazil at all because the whole of it goes into debt servicing and it's not enough. So they have to borrow. They have to borrow from the north <laughs> to add to to their surpluses in order to service their debt. Now this is terrible. For even for a, a country with a strong economy like Brazil, with a country like a weak economy like Tanzania, it's crippling. Uh, before we went, we, we, before Tanzania rescheduled its debt uh, two years ago, had we been servicing, I say had we been servicing our debt, because I don't think we were servicing. How could we service an impossibility? Had we been servicing our debt, we would be paying 63%, 63.5% of total earnings in order to service our debt. Now, that's an impossible thing. You can't do it. Uh, we, we, I don't think we are doing it. We rescheduled. As a result of rescheduling, now if we, if we service, I say if we service, I don't think we service. If we service, we'd still pay 48.5% 40, of total earnings in order to service our debt. Now, this is impossible. So, countries in this country... For, for us, we pay 70. You, you pay 70. <laughs> if you service. 70 <laughs> percent. Now, how can you pay 70 percent of your debt, of, of your total foreign earnings, in order to service debt? You can't develop. So it is a huge burden. These countries can't develop. So we have worked out. Uh, we and and the attempts which are being made, like the one I have referred to, like the Tanzania one. You go to to Paris, and these debts are rescheduled. And rescheduling means what happened? You postpone payment and you borrow more. So two things are happening. One, you postpone the payment, and then you borrow more. So the debts are going up. So the, when the day of reckoning comes, you pay more, <laughs> because the debt has gone up. <laughs> so the techniques are now of handling, the strategy of handling debt are not really, it's, it's not, uh, they're not tackling the actual, the basic problem of this country. And the basic problem of this country is that they should develop. We must reverse, we must reverse this, 
this money flow from the south to the north. And, and that must be addressed. And so the, the guidelines we are making uh, are intended to do this, to, so that you have a system of dealing with the problem of debt which reverses the flow, which enables these countries to begin to, to begin to grow, so that debt servicing comes through an economies which are actually growing, not economies which stop growing. For the African countries, we have suggested that um, an, a, a large number of African countries, their debts are official debts. Uh, the, I think 50, 53, 54 percent of African debt is official. And we've said this debt, this debt should be cancelled, cancelled outright. Uh, and. Um, it is, and that suggestion is not something very out, very wonderful, I think, because it's being done. Uh, already it's being done. The British are doing it. Uh, the Scandinavian countries are doing it. I think France is doing it. Canada is doing it. They, they cancel these official dates. But, and, they, and I say the reason why they do this are economic. You, you look at a country like Uganda, you say, look, how can Uganda now, how can you take money from Uganda? This is, this is criminal. How can you take, you know, these people need all their money. To, to develop their country and to take to take 70 percent of their earnings is ridiculous so if there is part of that is official debt we say that cancel that one out and and as i say several countries are doing it but instead of generalizing it and say for this category of countries this category of debt should be cancelled they they pick they select countries and this becomes although the reasons are economic the the, the methodology becomes political and we reject that we say for all these countries cancel official debt and we then make, we also make other, other suggestions. So what can these countries do? One, in the meantime, they, they, should, they should try and work for conditions of debt strategy which are bearable, uh, but continue working for a restructuring of their economies which does reduce the dependence, the present uh, chronic dependence of the South to the North. If they don't tackle that basic problem, they'll continue. Wata wata kopa mapesa, alafu wata rudi, wata yataondolewa, after 10 years, they start all over again if they don't tackle the basic problem. I would like to thank you very much uh, for asking your questions. Comrade President, I want to thank you very much, and I want to, through you, uh, to thank the people of Uganda for the reception they have given to me and my colleagues. Asante Nsana. With that press conference, Mwarimu Julius Nyerere ended his four-day visit to Uganda. Seeing him off was President Yoweri Seven, chairman of the National Resistance Movement, the vice chairman of NRM Haji Moses Chigongo, the three deputy prime ministers, cabinet ministers, the Tanzanian High Commissioner in Uganda, Mr. Hamani Nkwizu, the Army Commander, Major General Eri Tumwine, members of the National Resistance Movement Secretariat, and the Tanzanian Nationals in Uganda.
that was the last part of the historic visit by Mwalimu Julius Nyerere in July 1998. The events began by Dr. Kiza Besige, who was National Political Commissioner and Minister of State in the office of President Museveni, outlining the resistance council system which NRM hatched in the bush and uh, hailing it as the epitome of the type of democracy that has never been enjoyed in this country before. Then he invited uh, President Museveni to speak and the President launched into his favorite topic of Uganda having existed even before the colonial authorities created the protectorate. Then the president invited Mwalimu Julius Nyerere, who spoke in his two capacities as the chairman of the South Commission and chairman of the ruling Chama Chama Peoples. Now he has closed by that press conference in which he indicated that although Tanzania had played many roles in Uganda, it could not be held responsible for some of the things we ended up doing to ourselves. Wanapedia thinks that this has added value both to leaders in the National Resistance Movement because it is a reminder to many of them or a lesson to some of those who are new and then for Africa cooperation in general. We invite you once again to subscribe to Wanapedia but you can only do this if you stay alive and healthy. And that means following the SOPs of Nabi Yoweri Museveni's arc of staying at home when you don't have much business to do out there. It is dangerous. On behalf of Herbert Semiano, Tony Geoffrey Oana says, stay tuned.